Ryan from New Zealand. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Now, one of the things one of the things I want to go through very quickly, because um, it's pretty straightforward, but I've actually discovered a lot of new puppy owners don't have the right stuff mm -hmm. to prepare them for puppy ownership. Um, so I want to go through a quick shopping list. It's, this will be pretty brief, but maybe we can sort of detail why we like to uh, talk about, you know, why we like to like help students to have the right things, why these things are important. Because this is, again, you know, some of these things I didn't even understand the value of until, not only until after I was started training, but like when I started teaching students because I became an apprentice at McCann Dogs. And I'd see people who weren't using some of these items. And I'd think like, ooh, this is why this item is so important. Mm -hmm. For me, we're gonna talk about a crate in just a yeah. minute. For me, using a crate with my adult dog as I was retraining her changed everything. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why management for your dog is gonna be an important step in your training. It's gonna help you to be more successful. It's gonna make training more fun. Yeah, I think when whenever we get a new puppy, one of my like favorite things about like getting ready for the puppy to come home is like getting all the stuff. Getting all the stuff ready. And we've had lots of dogs, so I will say that sometimes we you know, reuse puppy things that we have from like a dog before. But very often I like to go and get like a brand new collar, brand new leash. Every all single brand time. new chew bones, everything, yeah. all of the new things um, to get ready for the puppy. And after all of this time, puppy after puppy after puppy, we definitely have a list that like of items that are must haves because we just know it makes um, life easier. So uh, first thing on the list is probably an obvious one, but it would be a collar. Um, Not that obvious because I think a lot of people are like, well, I'm afraid to put a collar on my puppy. Yeah, I or... guess you're right. Some people wait a little longer than they really should to put a collar on the puppy, but that's actually something that we put um, on the puppies. The, the second we bring them home um, so that they can get used to it. It's not, you know, uncommon for them to scratch at it a little bit when you first get them home. Um, but it is important to have a collar on them because um, you want to be able to have good control of your puppy. You want to be able to pick them up easily. You don't want to be grabbing them and, you know, grabbing at their body. So a collar is going to be really important. Yeah, so I just want to slow you down for a second because that is something that I learned. And, and as you see it more and more with students. So um, <clears throat> number one, you want to be able to, you know, interrupt your puppy if they're doing something wrong. But Kale mentioned you don't want to be grabbing at your puppy. Well, what if your puppy's about to make a mistake or put themselves in a, in a dangerous situation? You don't want the puppy, if you're reaching for them and you're trying to grab them and it's a little overwhelming, it also can become a game. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing you want is that your mm -hmm. puppy thinks that every time you go to take them up or whatever, you go to t pick them up, it's a game because you just don't want them to start to learn that, you know what, if I'm like agile enough and if I run under the couch, I yeah. get away. Yeah, or that's when you get more nipping and biting and you totally. just get bratty behavior because the puppies are like, woohoo, I have one up on you. Um, the thing with the collar though is, you know, as you have the collar on um, the puppy, you do want to make sure that it's properly fit and that you have a good size yeah. yep. um, and that you check it all of the time because puppies grow really, really quickly. We want to make sure that the puppy never has a collar that's too tight on their on their neck but I would say the more common thing is that people often have collars that are too loose on the puppy's neck and then either the puppy can squirm out of it really easily or it can get caught on things or it's uncomfortable or it's just not effective so sort of rule of thumb is to have um, it snug enough around the neck that you can just fit two fingers between um, their fur and um, and the collar uh, and it should be fairly snuggly but again we check it every our hands are in our puppy's collar and around their neck every single day just to make sure it's always the perfect fit so that it works well and that it's comfortable. So collar is going to be really important. Um, we would recommend for a puppy and even for a brand new dog, just a regular flat uh, buckle collar even yeah, even yeah. buckle over the snap just it's a little bit more reliable it's not going to come undone accidentally with an untrained dog um, try to stay away from some of the other options out there um, you know when you want to get to know your puppy a little bit too before going on to training equipment but first things first just a regular flat buckle collar is just the best place to start for any dog um, the next thing would be a leash and believe it or not we actually get a few different styles of leashes for our dogs um obviously we have uh the leash that will eventually walk our dogs on we also will use a long long line that we use for outdoors to give yeah. our puppies a bit more freedom but still have control and then the most important one that we use absolutely the most when we have a puppy is something that we call a house line which we're going to dive into a little bit as we get into the more of the topics but essentially it's like sort of a light leash 
cheap leash. We cut off the end of the handle. The loop, yes, um, there's no loop on it. It can't get caught so on anything. So it doesn't get caught on, on the, on the you know, uh, uh, furniture and stuff in your house. And that's what the puppies wear every single moment that they are not in their crate. And it works wonders for allowing you to get control quickly and effectively and easily. Uh, and a lot of people will say, like, oh, I tried using a house line, but my they puppy chew chewed it. on it. Yeah. yeah, and that's the point. That's okay. We uh, publish lots of videos to talk about what to do in that instance, but it's okay that they chew on it. You just need to interrupt that behavior mm -hmm. and give them something else to do. But having that extra four feet, it turns you into a puppy training superhero. Yeah. It allows you to interrupt the stuff that you might not otherwise interrupt. It'll, it allows you to keep your puppy from gobbling down a sock that fell out of the laundry hamper. Or hiding underneath the couch where you can't reach them. Yeah. You know, you can pull them out with a line and you can get control so much quicker. Um, it also allows you to look a little bit more like a leader because you're not chasing your puppy around the house playing the catch me if you can game. You're able to immobilize them quickly without getting mad, without getting yeah. emotional. And um, it really um, speaks to your leadership uh, to your puppy, which helps everything basically. So a house line is an absolute must. For sure. For sure. Next one you talk a little bit about is a crate. Now, mm -hmm. uh, 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 there's no comparing the... Um, the good information that a crate or a limited space area can give your dog. Now, I know some people say like, well, you know, I don't really want to use a crate. And that's okay, as long as you're using maybe something like an exercise pen or something that's small enough. But what's really important is that you're not giving your dog too much room. This is going to be incredibly important when it comes to things like potty training or house training. You basically want your puppy to have enough room to stand up, lie down comfortably, turn around, and just be comfortable in that space. That's why crates are so great. They're also super portable. But um, it's going to speed up your your um, your uh, puppy training. It's going to speed up your potty and potty training and house training. But it, way more importantly, it gives you an opportunity to be a great supervisor for your puppy, be mm -hmm. a great leader for your puppy, because. There's no way you can monitor the puppy 24 hours a day. And here's the bad news, is your puppy is always learning, whether you're there to give them information yep. or not. So if they're learning that it feels good to pee in the corner, not have to go outside, if it feels good to chew on your shoes, to um, you know eat the bottom out of a gym bag, then they're gonna think that's the right thing. <laughs> Well, having that crate or limited space area available to your puppy, you can put them in there with a, you know, something that they're supposed to have. A, maybe it's mm -hmm. a bone or something, maybe a little Kong toy, something. And know that they're safe and they're secure and you don't have to worry about what trouble they're getting into because they're in that uh, limited space area. And, and I mean, the amount of times people say, the amount of times people say, um, boy, I wish I'd started using a crate earlier. When people are like, nah, I don't really want to use a crate. Mm -hmm. It feels like a cage yeah. uh, or whatever. And then we convince them that like, and just try it. And it's so much it. harder to, to start crate training with a dog when you start much 100%, later. 100% yeah. for sure. Our crate training starts the day that the, the puppy comes home. So we don't necessarily, um, you know, take weeks to get our dogs accustomed to the crate. We just use it right off the bat and sort of just like ripping off a Band-Aid. And because we do a lot of specific training with the crates to help um, balance out the positivity like feeding them in the crate playing crate games um you know making it a positive experience for the puppy it literally just takes a short period of time before the puppies are like oh this is my place i love this and yeah i go there to nap you know we have older dogs now i have a 16 year old dog and if i leave the crate door open I often i'm like where's funky and she's Sleep is grand slams even worse yeah, about this. Our sure. one border collie, yep. he will be in his crate upside down, door wide open, like he chooses to go there. But I, I'm sure it's from from a puppy from a young age. We really conditioned that it was just a wonderful place to be. So he yep. never viewed it as punishment or something bad. He just viewed it as a place that he could go. He had a bone in there. He had his bed in there. He, you know, he had his his meals in there. Um, it was his little area. So it's really all about how we present it to the dog and on how they accept. It. Something, uh, another in important point to think about, and this is something that I discovered very quickly as I tried to retrain a two year old dog uh, to use a crate, yep. is that you immediately build value on you. Now, maybe your puppy's following you around everywhere around the house, or maybe, you know, I know I've seen a few people in here that are getting a puppy. Mm -hmm. We actually have a pre puppy guide available on our website that you should probably check out. Um, it's so good, too. Yeah. Lots of information. It's really helpful. McCandox.com, check out the pre puppy guide. But um, where was it going with that? Retraining the dog. Oh, great, great. what's so valuable, what's so remarkable is that your dog automatically sees you as more interesting, more engaging, worth paying attention to because every time they come out of their crate, you're there. 
they they aren't going to you know stare out the window for three hours. They're out there to do something with you. And right away you start to see that little flip, that little switch flip in their brain where switch they're flip. yeah or flip switch out in their brain so that you know when they're out when you're there they're like naturally looking to you for information looking for you looking to you to do stuff and that was one of the real like sort of side effects that I loved mm-hmm. about starting to use a crate even with a dog that already had you know poor behavior poor skills poor information by like refining things and only letting her get good information it's it just changed our relationship even before the skills were there well i think one of the main reasons behind that is that dogs really like structure they really like clarity yeah, yeah. and when we start to use a crate and we start to be really definitive about you know where you can and can't go in the house what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do and that information just becomes a lot clearer mm-hmm. the dogs start to go whoa you are really clear to me and I like that because dogs yeah. are always looking for leadership. They crave that. They like the structure. They like that type of, of feeling. And if they don't, if they're not getting that good information and structure from the humans in their household, then they sometimes feel like they need to step up and be the one that runs the show because no one else is doing it very well. So when we start to provide that nice structure where it's easy for the dog to make decisions, we take all of the guessing games out of it about you know what they need to worry about. They relax and go oh thank god someone else is is doing all the work yeah. for me now it's really easy so um you know that's why it, it works so well is because it it settles the dog it, it gives them less options and takes the worry out of things if you yeah i i, I was sorry i was looking at other things but um i'm just thinking about the amount of dogs that have developed some kind of anxiety when their owner leaves and they're pacing they're never apart right that's they're right. never apart absolutely but also they have there's too many options like they can go and bark at the window they can go and bark at the door they can pace up and down the living room for you know yeah and then they create bad away. behaviors that are then harder to, to they, change absolutely harder mm-hmm. to fix um i like laurel's question laurel says uh love your shows i'm getting a puppy in a few months question on He's, crates can i keep one on my first floor and another crate in my bedroom while having two crates confuse the puppy love where your head is at laurel so smart. Yeah. You can have 800 crates if you want all over the house if you really wanted to do that. But yes, this actually is something that we would specifically recommend to you, Laurel. Yeah. Um, you know, when we raise a puppy, we always have um, a crate in our bedroom right beside our bed. Our puppy sleeps in that crate right beside us. And then we have another crate in the most central location in our house so that they're just around. When we're in and out of the kitchen, the puppies are there. We also have a crate um, in our vehicles. We also have a crate at the dog school. Yep. Um, you know, we have travel crates that we take with us for hotels so we have all kinds of crates that we take crates so, here in the train station yeah like we I have said, remember we, we put them it's in the right change room there. yeah right there yeah. um yeah so wherever uh, we go so absolutely that will not confuse them um they're super adaptable in fact we have some wire crates we have some plastic crates we have crash proof crates in the vehicle there's all kinds of things that you can do dogs are super adaptable that's what makes them so great for sure um so great question yeah. and uh actually dan can you drop a link for laurel maybe to our uh playlist maybe the five alive uh, new puppy playlist i think we talk a lot about the reason we have two crates also setting up an overnight game plan uh, mm-hmm. will be helpful if you're a puppy owner that's definitely worth checking out yeah someone in the chat also asked about soft crates so soft okay. crates are okay to use but not with an untrained dog mm-hmm. um they can break out of them they can eat out of them so i usually wouldn't uh, introduce a softer crate we, we um, use soft crates yeah. with dogs who are crate trained yeah. yeah i wouldn't introduce it until much later in the dog's life when you know like there's not going to be any issues um um, and we wouldn't suggest you use them in a vehicle because they're absolutely not safe. But if you're going, you know, traveling or you want to be able to move it around, then it would be okay. But with a trained dog. The next thing I want to talk about is a bed. Now, um, this is a bit of a training tool at first because we'll use the bed to teach the puppy to go lie in a place. We will, you know, take a, a chew toy, which is another thing we're going to talk about. Take a chew toy, we'll put it on there, and we'll just give the puppy a little space. But we're not going to put a bed in their crate right away because we don't really know what they're going to do in there and we want to know that our puppy is safe and sound can't be gobbling up any bed fluff or you know whatever uh when when they're in their crate or or in their kennel so we're going to use a bed for training and again in that um in that series we show using a bed and it's so i need to at some point make a video at home where we're showing off like Here's what we did. Here's why we did these exercises mm-hmm. with the bed for the first couple of days. Now look at what happens. Yeah, yeah. Because you start to develop these uh, patterns for your dog where, uh, you know, you start, let's say every time you're making dinner at home, you ask your dog to go lie in your bed and you give them something to chew on or something. Or maybe you toss treats at the beginning. 
Well, now we start to make dinner and our puppy goes and he lies on his bed in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. We don't have to ask him to do it. We don't have to tell him it's to routine. go lie there. It's routine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's so much value there. And then you, you don't have to use things like your crate as much. You know, crates are for, great for training and they're great over the course of your dog's life. But you want to get to a point where you're not worried about what your dog is doing when they're out of their kennel. And this is a good in-between sometimes is giving them somewhere to be like a bed. Yeah, and I think sometimes people are really surprised when we say like not necessarily to put bedding in the puppy's crate, right? Yeah. Off the bat, right. it's like, oh my gosh, they might have to lay on the, you know, the cold floor. Um, but there's a couple of reasons why why we do it. Number one, and this doesn't apply to every single dog in the world. No, um, you know, nothing had, really does. No, there, it's everything's a bit different. But yeah. this is these are general suggestions based on our experience through thousands and thousands and thousands of dogs. Mm. Um, so number one is sometimes when um, we have a, a young dog, or actually any dog, we had this with our nine year old dog that we that we took in at a later yep. spot. Um, when bedding is in the crate, sometimes they're more susceptible to having accidents in the crate because if they go to the bathroom on the bedding or the stuffed animal or whatever it might be, they can push it off to the side and they still have a nice clean area to sleep. And that's what dogs prefer. They want a nice clean den. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're having accidents in the crate, sometimes a quick fix is just take any of the softer substances out of the crate so that the dogs don't want to you know, go to the bathroom where it's messy and then they'll be better about asking to go outside. The second thing is to and this is what I tend to deal with with my puppies my puppies are usually pretty good about not peeing in their crate or having accidents but my puppies if they're left alone in the crate or you know they decide that their chew bone in the crate isn't exciting enough they might try to rip apart the bedding number one I don't want them wrecking the beds but more importantly I don't want them ingesting something that could hurt them in some way and I was sort of giggling when you first started talking about the bedding because you know for me sometimes I will like brag about like oh my gosh my puppy like did this trick and I'm so excited but the other thing that I look forward to is when I can say guess what Five can have a bed in his crate now. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, like yeah. so exciting when that happens. Um, but you know what doesn't happen? He doesn't destroy the bedding. No. He's already house trained. Yeah. I mean, you've just gotten to that point so much sooner than you would Yeah, otherwise. Yeah, and actually with the most recent puppy that we have, he's a year and a half now and he has all kinds of bedding in his crate. He's a whip at cross and he loves to be snuggled like a bug. Um, however, I tried putting the bedding in a few times and then I would notice a little bit of chew marks. So then I actually had to take it out for a few weeks before I could try it again. So you just, you should be checking in making sure because the last thing you want is for your puppy to be hurt we have to talk about chew toys and interactive toys there's a big difference so many people make the same mistake and they get an interactive toy and they give it to their puppy as a chew toy and the uh they're amazed when the puppy chews it up and you know it's it's demolished in a couple of days um a chew toy is something that you're going to give to your puppy to sort of satiate that need to chew it's going to give them a pastime again maybe it's well you know they're in their crate or when they're out and you've asked them to lie on their bed or whatever the reason is gives them you know something to make their teeth feel good as they're going through the teething mm-hmm. process but a chew toy is something that's safe and, and like kong like nyla bone like something like that not a consumable necessarily but it's a toy and you can just Leave it with your puppy and not be too concerned about it. I don't know that we have any in the uh, train station We do. Here. It's right there. I, I can get it if you'd like me okay. to. Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe grab it. Um, now, there's a big difference between a chew toy and an interactive toy. And uh, an interactive toy, what's so amazing about an interactive toy is that it is something that has greater value because your puppy gets to use it with you, which is so Awesome, and we sell we sell a line of interactive toys. I think I tried to pin our puppy tug because I thought you guys might like the puppy tug. Um, we, it, it, it's all about engagement. Uh, if you imagine, if you imagine giving your it, the most fun time your puppy's having is when they're playing tug with you then what do you think they're going to seek out and look for in the future? They're going to be looking to you for that sort of same sort of engagement and like that elevation of their excitement. And the other amazing thing about uh, interactive toys, you can teach one of the most important skills that your puppy is going to have, and that is an out. We'll often start off, uh, if a puppy really likes toys or starts to engage with toys very quickly, we need to teach the out pretty darn quickly. And the great part is when you teach an out with a toy, you naturally get an out with some other things. Now, it obviously requires some um, practice and proofing, but you start to get the same behavior where your puppy will drop things on that word. So this is why we think we, we've, we know that interactive toys, why they're so valuable. Um, Okay, so for bones, um, now the reason why I was able to pull this quickly is because 
we've taken this away from the dogs because it's too small now but this used to be about twice the size and something like this is really good because when they chew it they're not going to this particular brand it's uh, from Nyla Bohm, um, but they're not going to not sponsored by the way <laughs> um, but they're not going to break off big chunks and swallow it and as the um, parts where the dog chew gets rough it like helps clean their teeth it's really really good so something like this would be great um, you want to be careful you know Kong toys are also really good they're a great pacifier you can um, stuff them full of things and that would be safe to leave for your dog as well they do come in different strengths as does the bone okay yeah this is good. what give her puppies rope toys like yes shreds. okay this is a good point look at look this look at this this was a student's rope toy yes it's not really um I hide my face there you go there you go um, yeah, so this was once a braided rope toy, and we have this pulled as an example because we like to show this to our students because what happens when the dog starts to rip this, these strings come off and they get intertwined inside your dog's stomach and intestines. And then what happens is if they can't throw it up and they can't get it out the other end, you're taking them to a, the vet to get a very expensive operation to get it removed. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's really just not worth it. So whatever keep dropping the thing um so these we don't recommend you use these styles of toys no um something like this we have about these really great uh, mccann dog puppy tugs now, this is a really old mccann puppy it tug. is it's very it's been used on several of our puppies now because they absolutely <laughs> Absolutely love it. It's a little bit ragged looking, but, but it's an interactive toy. Yes, and the reason why it's this is a couple years old now and still doing great is because we bring it out, we play tug, we do restraint recalls, we do all kinds of fun things with the pup, and then this goes away in our toy bin or in our training bag, and it doesn't come back out until we play again. And two things happens: number one, they can't chew it and rip it apart, so we can keep it for a longer time. But number two, when I go to unzip the training bag and I pull this out, yeah. my puppy automatically goes, "Oh my." God gosh, that thing, that's, it's about to happen. She's getting that toy out. And I start to build some great anticipation for my puppy in wanting to do something with me. We have a few minutes of fun. We tire the puppy out. And then I put the puppy's toy back away where they can't see it. And the puppy goes, hey, wait, 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 I want that thing. And I go, oh, it's done, it's over. And then the next time I bring it out, they're like, woohoo. So it keeps the dog more engaged, more motivated. Um, so these are really great things. But again, interactive. I don't give this to my dog to just go and play on her own or on his own this is something that we do together great relationship builder great way to tire your puppy out what 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 would it feel like if you every time you went out and you started to train your puppy if they wanted to listen you know how does it feel when you call your puppy's name and they come zooming back and you can give them like that reward mm -hmm. that includes you i mean you're just giving them great information and you're going to find that your puppy like it feels like they want to learn. They can learn faster, but it feels like they want to listen. And that is the yeah. core, <laughs> excuse me, of the McCann method. We want your dog to want to listen. It's all about motivation. So, you know, it's such a valuable, um, it's a simple thing, like an interactive toy can, mm -hmm. can really change your training, especially for some specific exercises, yeah. which we can talk about. Tammy A, thank you for the super chat. I haven't tooted all night, Toot -toot. but I'm about to. Tammy A, my 15-week-old Corgi is not super food motivated. Picky about treats. Other ways to train in your crate when told. He doesn't fuss anymore once in. Okay, so you're winning half the battle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, the obvious suggestion would be to try to do a little bit of fun crate training when your puppy is a little bit more hungry, hungry points of the day. Um, Meals, you know, when you're about to feed breakfast. Yeah, yeah. so like we actually uh, just trained a Border Collie not that long ago that wasn't terribly food motivated either. And, you know, there was some challenges that came along with that. But um, one of the things that was really helpful was to try and pick and choose the times where I knew she was a bit more hungry, like around mealtime. And then for part of her breakfast and for part, part of her dinner, for many weeks we would practice going in and out of the crate or we would practice walking at my side or whatever it was that I was working on in that moment and because she was already hungry that was really helpful um the other thing you might do is you know just practice telling your puppy in the crate and literally just placing them in the crate not in a in a mean way but just putting them in, shutting the door, woohoo, look at you, very good, and then let them out, and then repeat it literally right after, one after another, yeah. five or six times. And what might start to happen is as you say in your crate, just before you go to place them in, they go, oh, 
you just showed me this 10 times. I know what to do. And in they go. And when they go in on their own, you are going to throw a party to let them know that was a really good choice. So it might mean that food isn't necessarily your only motivator. You have your voice. You have affection. You have praise. You have touch. You have play. You could maybe try toys. You know, food definitely makes life easier. I am. I will say that flat out for sure. But it is not the only way to motivate and reward a dog. So sometimes you have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, it's funny how uh, sometimes we'll see comments on our YouTube channel that say like, oh, you know, um, my dog doesn't like food. I guess I can't use this training. Well, we use food for uh, some exercises with some dogs, but then we use toys for some yeah. exercises with some dogs. And maybe it's pet and praise for some exercises with some dogs. It's all about figuring out what's going to motivate your dog yeah. the best. We really want you to, uh, and you're going to discover that if, if you're a new puppy owner or you're about to become a puppy owner you're going to start to figure out you know what my dog loves this one treat or my dog loves this one toy make a note of that you know our, our online training team instructor shannon specifically will talk a lot about a training journal mm -hmm. and she'll have you write down five year puppy's favorite things and you start to use that scale of you know favorite thing um in different ways in your training and it can actually like unlock a little more potential and you can actually uh, little insider tip, you can build value for some of those higher, uh, lower value things just by using them the right way. And I think it's important to say that puppies fluctuate. So, totally. you know, sometimes totally. something that was one way while they were 12 weeks old could be totally different when they're older. So you don't want to write things off as well. You need to remember that as your puppy grows and gains more experience, gets more confident, starts to have a better relationship with you. Sometimes things that were motivating to them before are are, are different. So you just have to remember that, that things do change and that's pretty normal. Uh, the other thing I think that we should mention is that different environments will get different results. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the amount, and I know I'm sort of using puppy loosely, but some people will say the moment I go outside, I lose connection with my puppy. And you know, whether it's however old the dog is, let's say that they're, they're doing walking training or about to start some training outside, they completely lose their puppy. The puppy doesn't care about food. There's some strategies that we talk about uh, uh, figuring out how to, how to uh, get to that point. But there's also some like bridging that you need to do. Maybe part of the reward, like maybe your dog doesn't get to go outside until they've given you some attention mm -hmm. just inside the door or you've shown them that listen if we just just uh, you know pump the brakes a little bit and give me some attention or, or work on one skill in a, in a less distracting environment it allows you to it, it sort of like places what I'm trying to visualize it like places the stones across the river and allows you to get out in into an environment where you can be successful but if you just leap the river and you end up on the other side now it's a totally different environment your puppy's going to struggle. So figuring out uh, what motivates them in that situation and setting up the situation so that they're still motivated is also something to think about. Absolutely. A little bit about house training. A lot of people um, think that you can't start house training until your puppy's been home a week or you know you're four days in. I'll tell you and if you watch any of our puppy training series um, which you know, we're dog trainers, so we should get results pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But um, even when we've borrowed puppies for puppy series, uh, you can teach house training it's pretty so darn fast. quick. Yeah. So fast. Some of our strategies, like top line, uh, hard and fast rules for uh, puppy house training. Number one thing with house training. Number one thing. Why don't we start at number four and then we can do a countdown? I don't know how to categorize the three. Oh, I yeah, just want to say my one. I'll say more than I'll that. I'll do a drum roll. Okay. <laughs> Coming from somebody who actually can play drums very well, not me, him, that's terrible. Traditional group. Yeah. We should make Ken drum for us sometime. He's very, <laughs> yeah. very good. Uh, anyways, number one thing that I think is really important when it comes to house training, supervision. Because yeah. if you are not watching your puppy and you're missing, number one, you're missing them having accidents in, in your house. So now they're learning that it's okay to have accidents in your house. But the other thing is if you're not watching closely, you are going to miss some signs that your puppy may be giving you yeah. that says, hey, yo, I have to go to the bathroom. Sure. And when they're first learning, when they're really young, or if they have no experience, regardless of age, um, they might not know that you are the ticket 
to going outside. They might just do that. normal yeah. behaviors like start to sniff or start to disengage or try to go off by themselves. Or some puppies will actually be smart enough to put two and two together and they'll go to the door. Again, nothing to do with you, but they're thinking to myself, gosh, I got to go to the bathroom. And they start to get a little antsy and jumpy. And if you're paying attention, you're going to be able to go, huh, that's different behavior from my puppy. I wonder if it means they have to go to the washroom. And that... Or bathroom, us Canadians. Pee, I know. if they have to go pee or Potty, poo. whatever. I never say what he wants me to say. I just speak in Canadian. Washroom, oh yeah. Canadian well, we're heading terms. off to the washroom, eh? Okay. From now on, if I say washroom, you all know what I mean. Pee or poo. Um, anyways, <laughs> I'm not saying pee or poo. It's just ridiculous. Um, anyways, uh, then you know they need to go outside. So that's yeah. going to be really, really important. You need to watch very, very closely. So supervision is really key. And then a couple other things that are really helpful is knowing normal times when they're going to have to go. That could be when they've woken up from um, woken up from a, a nap. Yep. Um, that this could is be, really common. Mm -hmm. That's a very common one. Some like, people oh, just want to snuggle oh, and yeah. like have a little moment. Yeah. And, you know, and then two seconds later, they've gone to the bathroom. Well, you could have prevented that by going outside first and then done the snuggling. Snuggling is great, but it should be after after we've had a pee or a poo. Ah. Um, or um, it could be when um, you've just fed them. Some dogs will have to go to the bathroom or the washroom or pee and poo right, <laughs> af right after that. Soup. Or... Um, <laughs> <laughs> or the other thing um, that maybe people don't recognize quite as much is um, after you play with them. So if yeah. you stimulate your dog's body and they're rocking and rolling and moving all around, that gets things flowing and then sometimes it makes them have to go to the bathroom. Um, so you need to be on that. In fact, I will use that. I know with Five, when he was younger, our, our puppy, he wasn't always so good about um, having a oh dear god uh going um poo before going to bed and i wanted to make sure he had a poo before he went in his crate for the night and so sometimes if i would just you know play a little tug with him on the lawn or get him to chase me around a little bit and get him running literally it would be within like 20 seconds he would have a poo um versus just standing around so that's a good thing uh, to know about house training as well this is um this is a secret also for train you. your puppy to tell you to, uh, that they have to go outside it makes life yeah. So much easier. And pee on command. Train them to go to the bathroom on command. Yeah. Oh, I have, I have a good story to tell. I need to pick this up. Yeah, so we, we have a couple of videos on the channel that teach you how to teach your puppy oh to pee on command. It's a disaster right now. Oh okay, boy. we're good. We're under control. Sam? Okay. <laughs> Get Sam in here to um, sort out the When set. I was coming home from the Amsterdam... Um, Kale just got back from the World Championships of Dog Agility. Yeah, so I went to the Netherlands to compete for Team Canada at the Agility World Championships. It was absolutely Sorry. amazing. It's okay. Um, anyways, on the way home at the Amsterdam airport, there's like no grass around and Beeline was about to go on like an eight or nine hour plane ride. And so the only grass that we could find were like big planters along the side. So I went, wait, I probably shouldn't be admitting I, this. I don't know but if you, I'm just thinking, is this good, a good idea? You know what? I'm honest with you guys. Yeah. This is These just what's dog happening. Owners, they get also, it. dogs need to go to the bathroom. So it is what it is. Anyways, yeah, so I trudged her down there. I picked her up onto the thing and she's like, what the heck? And I was like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And then she had a nice pee and a good poo. <laughs> and uh, I did pick it up. And then, um, and then I felt just so much better when she had to go do her flight. So uh, going to the bathroom on command is essential for I mean that's an extreme situation yeah. but certainly if it's raining you're late for work whatever it might be there's nothing that's less stressful than leaving knowing that your dog has had a poo maybe yeah. I'm alone on that but that you, makes me feel good you guys as puppy owners <laughs> uh get this um little secret hack Sue, that's you know, so cute. as you as you go to you know go overnight when it's time to you know for your puppy to go sleep and so you need to sleep as well. Uh, so, something that we'll always do is some physical activity. Activity. We'll get out our puppy tug and we'll play some tug. We'll do restraint recalls up and down the hallway. We'll do something to really get that puppy moving and shaking and then we'll take them out before bedtime so that they can pee and poo so that their bladder and their bowels are empty. Um, you're going to see better over, overnight uh, success. You're not going to be getting up at 1.30, 3.30, 4 o'clock. You know, it's, it's just going to set your puppy up for that full night's sleep. In fact, it's funny, we, I mean, we've had, I don't know how many series on puppies in like the first night home, first 24 hours, first, all this first stuff. And people are always shocked at how quickly we teach the puppies to sleep overnight. Yeah. But it's, if it's you like do th what we days. tell you, yeah. it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. You just need to set yourself up. Um, I don't like anyway. being woken up. No. I want to sleep all through the night. Well, uh, ha listen, if you have a puppy at home, you're probably tired. I get it. It can be exhausting. Yeah. And the last thing you need is to be 
up all night as well. So I, I can totally empathize. I remember, uh, you know, our puppy days, which actually I did long ago, but it, you know, it can be tiring because you're, you're always doing something with a puppy and you'll also have this entire life to live outside of just taking care of the puppy. So I get it. So set yourself up to be successful overnight. Okay, we've talked about uh, crate training. We've talked a little bit about house training. I do want to mention, okay, let's get to nipping prevention. Let's talk about nipping and biting. D does anybody in the chat right now, are they struggling with nipping and biting with your puppy? Pretty common thing. This is something we we talk a lot about, actually, in our uh, Puppy Essentials program. Really quickly, Kale, let's we talk, have to get talk into about the circle uh, you know, nipping and biting and, and what we do in our program for coaching. Yeah, I would say one of the main reasons why people um, is register for a program is because they want to get on top of the nipping and biting. It is incredibly frustrating, and it truly is something that does not need to last very long if it's addressed appropriately. So we do take a lot of time to focus on how to teach the dog that nipping and biting is not appropriate, um, but it's not all based on correcting the puppy for the behavior. We will show you how to effectively do that, of course, but what people don't realize is that when you actually build a good relationship, relationship with your puppy, when you give them good information, when you manage your puppy well, when you train them to do certain things, it actually alleviates the dog's need or want to nip and bite you in the first place. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. So that's why doing a, a puppy training program is really important because it encompasses, encompasses the entire um the entire process and you know a lot of people say well why does your puppy nip and bite at you well they don't really think to because they're molded and shaped from a young age to learn how to be respectful and how to really want to listen to me because of the training that we do. It just sort of stops it from there. So, And in the program, you get like personalized feedback. It's yes. not just another bunch of YouTube videos. Yeah, for sure. So whether you come to us in person or whether you uh, visit, uh, whether you train with us online, um, it's and especially people are hesitant about the online thing because they think they're just going to watch a bunch of videos and then they'll be like all by themselves. Um, but that is not the case. We hold your hand every step of the way. We watch videos we have weekly live um, calls that we do over zoom where we see you face to face and you can ask questions and we talk about it it really is super interactive and um, I think one of the things that people like the most other than the zoom calls because we have so much fun is the fact that you get to um, connect with all kinds of other puppy owners that yeah. are literally going through the same things yeah, you are totally. and I think sometimes that support system along with the instructors can be so helpful so when it comes to nipping prevention some things that we insist that you do because it's going to set you and your puppy up to get through this part of your training process have a house line things like making sure that you're not putting your puppy in. so many people say like yeah well he, i'm on the couch and he's biting my bun you know they, they have their hair up and he's like tugging yeah. on my uh sweater you know you're gonna make why some... is he near your bun in the first place <laughs> that's right i mean putting your if you have a puppy and you're working on nipping and biting some things you're not going to do is elevate them bring them way up in and around your face or you know uh let them have at it with the kids because the kids are so squeaky and bouncy and having so much fun but the puppies just thinks they're litter mates and your puppy's going to chew all over mm -hmm. them so you it's 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 so much about good leadership choices and it's not even about the biting and the nipping it's about good leadership choices yeah. and you know what are a couple of leadership tips that you've given to people who have really struggled with nipping and biting uh, definitely definitely the elevation thing that you said um also too in situations where your puppy is more prone to nip and bite, maybe at certain situations like getting them in and out of the crate or getting them in from outside or um, certain times of the night, sometimes people, they say their puppy enters what they call witching hour or the puppy zoomies where the dogs are just wild and crazy. Well, if you, it's nothing better than being able to predict when something is going to happen because then you can make a completely different out, out um, uh, what's the word? Not word. Outcome. Outcome. Thank you. Oh, I could not think of that. Um, a completely different outcome. Maybe you have a specific routine that you do with your puppy to go in and out of the crate. Maybe when, you know, 7 o'clock comes and they have a normal witching hour, maybe at 6.30 you're out, outside doing a bunch of fun recalls yeah, and yeah. and um, training exercises that tire your puppy out. By the time 7 o'clock rolls around, your dog's like, woo, nap time. I'm exhausted for all that training. So it's about learning about what your puppy needs so that you can set them up to make better choices. Um, 
And then also, too, being a good leader. Don't give your puppy 800 commands without following through. You know, say what you mean, mean what you say. Um, don't put them in situations where it, it eggs them on to nip and bite. Lots of times people don't realize that the way they move their body or the way that they interact with their dog actually provokes nipping and biting. If they just presented themselves in a little bit more of a controlled manner, the puppies don't even try it in the first place. So um, there's so much that we can tell you. Um, yeah, I, but we can't do it on. all now. But but that was I come think, to puppy essentials. Well, I think th- I think those are some pretty good starting <laughs> steps, yeah. and these are things that are actionable tonight for yeah. you guys uh, that are struggling with puppy nipping and biting. Also, we have so many pu- nipping and biting videos that can give you some like pretty straightforward, simple information uh, to deal with your nipping and your biting. Next, we need to talk about training when it comes to having that new puppy experience because the thing that I didn't really understand is I had this expectation that when I got my first puppy that I could I should wait I should wait until she's a little bit older and then I could start teaching her things well your puppy comes home ready prepped to learn they are little sponges and as I mentioned earlier if you aren't if you aren't supervising them making sure they're getting good good information if there's an absence of information then whatever feels good is what they're going to do because yeah. because they think it's right so some of the training that will start on the very first few days home and deep into like their you know 8 12 16 weeks old like some of the puppy stuff that we'll be working on in a quiet environment at home is uh, loading the word yes Let's talk about what the word yes means for new puppy owners who might not have heard it before. Yeah, I'm sure it's probably obvious, but the word yes is what we do to pinpoint when our dog is correct. But what might not be obvious is the way we use it. So that needs to come within a specific time frame, which is one second. And in the early stages of training, we always follow that yes word up with a physical reward of some sort, whether that's a treat, whether that's a little play of tug, whether that's a pet um, affection, whatever it might be. So yes needs to be followed immediately by some type of positive reinforcement so that eventually the word yes alone becomes the positive reinforcement in itself. Yeah. Um, and it's better than using a clicker. Now, it's, I mean, yeah. we're, we're doing the same thing as if you were using a clicker now we will use clicker yep. a clicker as we get into more advanced skills and for very specific tasks clickers a great option yeah but I, a, I much prefer a yes 100%. Uh, uh, with puppy training and especially. you always have it with you it's always, always have it with you, with you also too if any of you guys have heard me train before i change my voice all of the time when i'm training i might give like a yes i might give a yes good for you yay yes. Yes. yay like so many things so i can change my voice and the puppies are like whoa you are yeah, happy totally. um and the puppies really respond to that they love that change of voice they love that playful tone um and that's why using your voice in training is so important and that's where you can utilize the the yes for sure um we do things like taking the caller like teaching our puppy that it it's good for it to allow me to take your caller because we're going to be clipping on their leash a million times a day we're going to be wanting yeah handling for sure does anybody have a dog or have had a dog that is like definitely afraid of nail trims or afraid of going to the the, the assessment at the vet um we actually did a vets uh clinic not that long ago shannon uh, instructor shan oh no instructor robbie and instructor K- and kale did uh, uh, a thing your wife yes yeah, sorry yeah um <laughs> did, did a thing for veterinarians talking about like these are some of the steps that we've found have been really important for getting the dog comfortable with handling and mm-hmm. uh you know i know we uh, a couple of vets that i know well um say things like we love when we get your students in because those puppies have had been handled and they're much more comfortable and they're with easier the to assess then for sure yeah they actually dogs who are better with handling literally get a better assessment yeah. from the vet because they actually can get in there and truly totally. do what they need to do yeah. um your dog's going to get better care if they accept a handling more yeah for mm-hmm. sure um but things like that uh response to name you you want to teach your puppy that name really early here's the here's the trick though you have to be careful that you're not overusing your puppy's name so many people spot spot Spot, 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 sit, this, spot here, that, spot, yeah. spot. So you, your puppy's name becomes a really sacred, valuable thing and we'll only use it in those first few weeks home when we intend to reward it or when we know our puppy's going to be successful. Instead, we'll use something like a, an informal, pop, pop, pop here, pop it, pop it out. We'll just make all these silly, bubbly sounds. Instead, That's pretty good. You can go pretty high. Instead, oh, pop, 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 p
But we'll just use these funny sounds to get our dog's attention and bring them in close to us, but we won't be using their name unless we're sure we're, it's a training opportunity mm -hmm. because we don't, want to un, we don't want to teach them that if I call your name, you can ignore me. It's not a big deal. Yeah, we don't test, we don't test commands like that until a little later on in the training. Actually, I have something that I want all of you guys to work on. Dan, can you drop can you drop uh, the link to the video where we did the restrained recalls outside? We do this we do this exercise every single with day with Percy, right. We do this exercise every single day with our own puppies and we always encourage students and uh, you at home to do this kind of thing daily because it's a great way to teach your puppy their name, make it exciting, make it fun, make it, you're getting grab your McCann, uh, your McCann puppy tug and use that as a reward for your puppy because it really like allows them to love that ending. But um, check that video out. It's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, exactly the kind of thing that we're doing with our dogs every single day day when they're training. Sue just made a good comment about um, the response name. She said this is where nicknames come in handy. Yeah. Um, that's so true, Sue. You know, having some good nicknames for your dog is a great way to make sure that you aren't um, ruining the response of their actual name until you actually have a bit more training. So that's a very good suggestion. Totally. Um, okay. The next thing is socialization. Um, this is a really important one because I think that it's something that people put um, a lot of weight in when puppies are young, which I completely agree with. However, how you socialize your puppy early on is really important because it can um, sometimes do more damage than more good if it's not done well. So when we say the word socializa socialization, um, most times what people think about is dog to dog interaction. And what we think about as dog trainers, when we say the word socialization is that is one aspect of it, yep. getting them comfortable around new dogs, um, but, yeah. around new people, but mostly it's experiences. It's getting them to different places. It's exposing them to different footing, um, new locations, um, new sounds, um, lots of different people. That doesn't necessarily mean like actual interaction with people, just being around people. That's why going to class is so important. You know, people often say to me, they, they think like, you literally like are the general manager of McCann Dogs, why do you take every single, I take every single level at our McCann Dog School with my puppies. I design the programs, I t teach all of the classes. It's not yeah. like I need, I need to go to learn. I, I know what I'm doing. However, it is invaluable to get my dog out and totally. around yep. other distractions and people. I'm not just gonna train my dog in my backyard on my own. I want to expose my dog to new people, new places, new sounds, and I want them to gain that experience. And so, not, really not to important. get out and play with other dogs. That's nope. not the goal, especially nope. the amount of dogs that come in to us for behavioral problems that have had one event that was bad for them. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a worried dog that's been clobbered or a, a big, you know, a, a I've had outgoing that assertive dog that like has yeah. learned that the more rough and tumble I get, the more I get my way. And now we have to fix the problem that your dog thinks that they can, you know, steamroll every other dog they see on the street. Yeah. This is about the experience of listening and learning it being apathetic about the fact that there's other dogs around. Not that you like them or don't like them, just the fact that they're there and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. We were just talking about this yesterday. It's fun to watch Five Alive in your agility class. And why is that when, when he's not working? Um, what do you mean? Well, we were talking about the fact that he can go lie on his bed. Oh, what we were talking about last yeah, night. Oh, yeah. sorry, I misunderstood you. Yes, I was saying, um, I just started taking a few little agility classes with Five Alive, my young dog. And he doesn't know how to do all the equipment yet, but what I'm trying to do is give him experiences and get him used to being in that agility environment since that's you know my, my goal for him. And I was telling Ken last night that one of the things that I love so much about his training up until this point is that he is already able at just a year and a, a, year and a half old old to lie you know outside the the agility ring no crate no nothing lay calmly at my side and just watch and checks out with me and and he's calm he doesn't bark he's just very chill he's respectful and he's you know taking it all in and it's yeah. so lovely and then we go out and we play agility and he's a speed demon and he tugs like crazy and he has a lot of fun and then our turns over and we go and we wait calmly and it's just such a great way and I know that part of the reason why he's been able to do this is because I take obedience classes every single week with him. He learns about being patient and about seeing things that are happening in front of him and not barking and lunging and getting stimulated. He's learning to have good self-control. So it was really so fun. Yeah, this is great. Vanessa, 
Uh, we didn't have a class to go to. So it, we're in a very rural area. So we used the Home Depot parking lot and Amazing. store for socialization. Amazing. That's exactly the kind of thing yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's funny. Get it, out and about your neighborhood and get into some situations where you can keep things controlled. Well, and, and eventually it's we get like flack sometimes where people are like, well, you know, I don't want my dog to do, do whatever thing forever. I don't want them to be in a crate forever. I don't want them to ignore other dogs forever. But I'll tell you, there will come a time when you can introduce and, you know, have your dog around other dogs. But wouldn't it be nice if they still thought that you were the most important thing in that environment? Like they could go run and play. Our dogs go run and play with our other dogs, yeah. but not until we know that, that they are come back. They're going to come back when we call them, that mm -hmm. they know that there's not an option, buddy. Hey, when I yell five and he comes zipping back mm -hmm. out of a group of our, you know, dogs that we're all walking together. But we also really know the group of dogs that we're with which is always something yeah that we talked about that's a lot about this one of their they often see people come in from like dog park things yeah and um, you just don't know you just don't know who's yeah. out there or if they're vaccinated etc so. yeah you know one of the things that i did with my puppy to help him with this is um i have a friend who has a dog uh, similar aged and we would get together and let the puppies play together and then we would practice our recall and um we would have the dogs on long lines and we would have you know high value rewards and we would let them play for a few seconds and then we would practice calling them away to come back to us and if they didn't stop the moment we called them then we were able to um grab the leashes and we we would practice this every single week. We would get together and give them a little socialization and control time. And for several weeks, it was just going awesome. And then what happened is they started to get a little older and they started to love each other a bit more. It's a teenage phase. Yeah. And their recalls started to get a little slower yep. and they started to think about it. So then the next like two or three weeks, we would still get together, but we wouldn't even let them play. We would, we would walk near each other and then call our puppies away. We would practice sit stays with the puppies side by side. And we were sort of training them. Okay, you're together guys but yeah. like you always yeah. have to focus once we did that we would let them play again and they were so much better after that so that was great exposure great socialization and I recognize not everybody has a friend that you know has a perfectly well-trained dog I mean our dogs were not well-trained at that point um, but that's the kind of exposure we're talking about but you also don't need you know you you need to be able to control the situation yeah you know it doesn't have to be an especially well controlled dog if you're two people dog owners yeah. that are well intentioned and are going to work through whatever problems you're going to encounter and are ready to do the work and not exactly. just say oh it's easier exactly. just let them play totally. then they'll be tired totally. yeah. well now you're not really doing anything for your recall or anything else you need to make the hard choices in the early stages so that you can actually affect change so that you actually can truly give them the ability to have some freedom I want to know that if I take my dog for a hike in the woods or if I go for a walk around the property with you know 15 other dogs that if I I call him he's going to come to me and I want that reassurance and I'm I am bound and determined to make sure that until I know that's going to happen I am not going to allow the dog just to go and ignore me because that's just going to take longer for me to reach our goal and the goal is to give be able to give the dog a lot of freedom that's that's my goal I don't want to have to keep my dog on leash or, or be upset I want I want to give my dog freedom to let him you know enjoy his life but be safe and, and listen turn the lights on um I Sam we're ready to go over. We have a new set here in the train station, and we're ready to go over there. Um, I pulled Kale away from class the other night because we were talking about something, uh, and she'd mentioned it to her at the classroom, that I thought was so important that I wanted to make sure I shared it with you tonight here, knowing that we were going to do some puppy content. But um, first, we have to head on over to the news, the news desk. I was just teaching a training class and I mentioned so something this, that the students were really... I'm going to just pause this for a second. I want you to see... Uh, okay. Now... This I, is quite the news desk. Yeah. Well, I you, love it. I, I, didn't, I didn't quite uh, set up... Oh, my hand's not... Beautiful. Okay. It's beautiful. Um, check this out, guys. This is going to be valuable, I think, for anybody who has a dog in training. And uh, let me just make sure my volume's good. Um, it's honestly something that... You get an interesting response when you mention this to students. Um, you know, some people are like, yeah, I guess I guess that makes sense, but I just want you, to, you guys to hear it as well. Let me find it. Find my audio. I was just teaching a training class and I mentioned something that the students were really surprised to hear and I wanted to tell you guys about it as well. One of the questions I asked is why do you think that the puppies and the dogs listen so well when they come to class and they can't necessarily replicate that same great behavior when they go home? And the reason for that is when they come to class, 
we ensure that there is consistency. We ensure that there is follow through. So if the dog struggles, and they do, they do struggle, we are there to show the dog what to do differently. And they are not able to rehearse that bad behavior for very long before one of the instructors comes over to the student and says, hey, why don't you try this instead? But what's really going on is how the dog interprets this situation. They may go to jump on someone, they might go to pull on the leash, but they're only able to do that for a moment before they're being taught to do something different instead. So they're not getting to rehearse that bad behavior for over, you know, over and over and over and over again before somebody interrupts them. And what happens is if that person, that student isn't able to take that same consistency, that same great timing, that same great, great information and replicate that at home, at the park, at the cottage, wherever it might be, those dogs start to learn that there's multiple sets of rules. One where they have to be really good in class, where they know that the rules are going to be consistent and that there's follow through. And then a set of rules at home where nobody really makes them do anything, or maybe they're not even paying attention to what happens. So the moral of the story here is that you need to remember that dogs are learning every single second of the day. And if you are not there to mold and shape their behaviors and their decisions and let them know what's right or wrong, it's going to be really hard for you to get consistent behavior in any situation that you need to. Be. I was just teaching a training oh, class and I mentioned oh so you have to listen it's, to me it's again. a loop it's a loop um so it was that, that I thought that message was, was so important I not I, I mean Sam just polished the desk and he turned on okay. all the lights whatever you do whatever you want okay here. you know what Sam she, I don't think she likes it we might have to make some changes to the newsroom I hope you guys enjoyed the trip over here let's head on back to the train station great job buddy I think everybody really liked it <laughs> Um, that message is so important that we said it a couple of times. I wanted Kale to re reinforce it with uh, in that last clip. It, it, it's just, especially as a puppy owner, this was such an important takeaway for me. Th make make your choices and think about think about what choices your puppy has because if you limit their choices to only the good stuff and you're there to give them the information, if they happen to make the wrong choice, boy oh boy, your puppy training is going to speed up. It's mm -hmm. going to be that you know how you got a puppy and you're like oh this is going to be so great and they're going to be so cute and we're going to be the best friends and then they get home and you're like what have ah, i done what? this this might have been a mistake this is not going well it doesn't have to be so uh, uh, i want you to really be mindful of that do you have do you play music for your dog it, it, you know do you when you go out do you put on the radio or do you like i don't know if people put on the radio anymore put on your i don't think people put on the radio yeah. anymore i think they say alexa play my careful don't sit, i Careful, these guys might have Alexa. You're right. So, Play McCann Dog's music. <laughs> yeah, she will. Um, we're actually, we've worked with some digital music creators to create music specifically for dogs at a very specific beats per minute with a very specific ebb and flow. Some content specifically that's made for like thunderstorms with extra low frequencies that mask some of the noise. If you have a dog that's worried about thunderstorms, but we also have a YouTube channel here on YouTube. At the end of tonight's show, I'm gonna send you guys directly there. After we uh, do an outro, I'm gonna uh, send you directly to that McKenna Dogs music channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And it's available on uh, Spotify, uh, Apple uh, Music, it's on YouTube, it's all, anything, anywhere you can get music. You can turn on McCann Dogs music so that your puppy can be more relaxed uh, during that period when you're not home working on crate training. Yep. Fill the room with McCann Dog's music. It's just going to give you that extra stuff. We all the do. time. We do. You know I how we came up with it? I literally had it set up on an iPad when I was in Netherlands. When I would like yeah. go out for dinner for the night and leave B like in my hotel, I would leave McCann Dog's music just playing away for her you, so she could chill out. Do you know? So we traveled a couple years ago now, or I'm, I'm not sure how long ago it was. We traveled and uh, we had Beeline, who's uh, one of our dogs, who's pretty noise sensitive. It was you know, last year. She, yeah. She's, she's a little noise sensitive. And mm -hmm. um, Kale was competing and we had to leave the place we were staying. And we we're a little bit worried that she was going to be like stressed, stressed out. out. Yeah. And that's the last thing you want, especially when you're at a high level competition. So we uh, started talking and decided at that point that we needed to do something about that. We wanted to like make music just for dogs. I mean, you can play it and it sounds good and, and it's not like it's completely nice to outrageous. work too, really. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it, but it's, uh, you know, put together so that you can have that same experience that we did. We started to play it for our dogs and we're like, geez, this is working. You know, this is great. So um, check it out, McCann Dogs Music. Um, also, 
Before we leave you guys, uh, you check out the links in the description if you want to join us for Puppy Essentials or Life Skills or even maybe you're close by. Maybe you're in, you know, one of the cities around us. You can join us in person in our training And by facility. close by, we are in Flamborough, Ontario, Canada. Sometimes people don't realize that we are Canadian, but we are from Ontario, Canada. So you want to work with us in person. Absolutely. Now, um, I think that's about it at this point. I think we've given you guys the seven things. That was a lot. The shopping list, the collar and line, the crate, house training, nipping prevention, training, socialization, and we went to our new set to talk a little bit about good information for your puppy. We good? Great. Now, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. Happy training. Yeah. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training. <laughs>